Yeah, thank you, Alexi, and thank you, Anna, for inviting me. And um, so much thankful for uh, Digital Futures and for KTH community as a whole for giving me this opportunity. I will today start um, since <clears throat> by presenting uh, a brief about my research, but might be also presenting something about uh, my previous work and where I worked and such things. Um, so first of all, I come from the city of Alexandria. City of Alexandria is uh, in the northern coast or the southern coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, it is the place of uh, the well-known um, Alexandria Library, which is around 2000 years old, but unfortunately it has been burned. Mm. I was graduated from uh, uh, Alexandria University Faculty of Medicine, as we call it, and it has the its symbol is the Alexandria Lighthouse, which was one of the world's seven wonders, which nobody has seen or has an, an idea about how it was really like. But anyway, I had a PhD in Stockholm University in learning analytics, as Alexi has said. And then I worked in uh, University of Paris, Descartes University, which has been dismantled now, or probably kind of they made a collection of universities into University of Paris. Uh, and I studied science of science, how different groups can work together to create uh, successful projects using uh, special uh, sensors and uh, create networks. I then uh, had a postdoc at the University of Estin, Finland, which I study learning analytics, teach learning analytics and social network analysis and philosophy of science <clears throat> and such things. Then I came to KTH uh, with Olga and Stefan, Olga Peperi and Stefan to uh, pursue a postdoc in learning analytics. And, uh, and uh, also through the digital future. My research is, is a bit interdisciplinary. I do lots of learning analytics and lots of things related to learning. But to be consistent today and to give an idea about one thing, I kind of decided to limit it only to network research or things about networks. <clears throat> So, uh, which is the second thing. I have some collaborations with some people, and of course, uh, Olga Vidberry is one of the most important of them. These are the other people and they are represented again <clears throat> as a network. So uh, what is learning analytics? <clears throat> learning analytics has been motivated by the availability of data. So it started from looking at industry, for example, amazon.com, Netflix and all the other big industries that used, or Google that used this data to create some value or you know boost their advantages or increase sales or increase marketing or increase engagement with their websites. For example, Netflix could offer you a, a nice suggestion of a movie based on the movies you have watched and then you will watch more and more and you will be more likely to subscribe and continue subscribe to Netflix. So the people in education said, okay, we can use the data in a similar way. However, it turned out to be far much more complex than Netflix watch or not watch uh, problem. The idea of, net, of learning analytics is to capture data, clean this data and prepare it for analysis, analyze it and interpret it and give some insights. And based on these insights, you take an action and then you get some feedback and then the, the loop, uh, repeats itself again by you reflect and adjust and improve the capturing process, the cleaning and preparation. And it's a self iterative process, or hopefully at least. In simple words, if we have some kind of a course log like that, which this is recorded for model learning environment, uh, uh, learning management system, we can convert it into something like that. And all of these images, as you say, I will go through them are created from model logs. So the first thing we call trace log data, which gives you a, a, a view of what traces students have clicked on or what the resources has been clicked on. Every color represents a certain trace, or you can get frequency data. These are the students have been, for example, most of the time engaged with task, sometime with social activity, sometimes planning, or you can understand the process. I will give more about that. You can also create visualizations of the distribution of what has been good and what has been wrong. For example, in this graph, you see that the theory was not really good. You can also see their processes, 
You can use unsupervised clustering to classify them. You can create a network among interacting things, or you can create a timeline for events. I will go through everything, but again, I will only focus on the last row, which is network things, <clears throat> to, uh, to offer something meaningful in this presentation. So the gaps in learning and analytics so far are, they are very difficult to reproduce or generalize. People who create some value or some insights or some findings, they are not able to take them, for example, from KTH even to Stockholm University across the same city. We still have very big difficulty linking our insights, our data, our approach, our analysis, our findings to learning theory. We still so far or very far away from informing a data-driven intervention. Of course, there are many successful applications, but there is nothing consistent or systematic. They still have problem with accounting for context, process, or time. We are trying, we're improving, but we're not there yet. And that's what research is ongoing now. <clears throat> I will not go into all of this, but I will, again, focus on the networks. And um, I will start by an example I usually cite. Mark Granovetter had made a, a very nice article, 1973, while he talked about something called weak ties. What Granovetter said is that most people get jobs through their not so very well-known contacts, which he called at this time the weak ties. And this is exactly what brought me to KTH. Uh, at the time that I've known Olga, we were kind, she just kind of, uh, she, she tested me and we were not that very good uh, friends or colleagues, we were not collaborating at the time. But through this weak tie that, or the ties that links KTH to SCU, I was, you know, she suggested after some time to get to, to apply and apply, then everything happened. So the network are very, very powerful and they define many things in our life. Sometimes we don't understand that. People always think sometimes of the weak, strong ties. I know that person very well, but also weak ties, according to Granovetter, if you see here, almost 84, 5% of people get their uh, jobs through their weak ties. So the networks works for us in many, many ways. I will, and I will show that. Network research is really, really getting high and uh, the, the number of grants are soaring, the number of publications, the number of journals, the number of scientists. There is at least now uh, four or five disciplines that are purely network. Network science, social network analysis, organizational networks, probabilistic network models, psychological networks. There are many, many fields and subfields that are purely network oriented because of the power of the network. Again, I will go through what network is. So a network is simply composed of a building unit. The building unit is an edge, which is composed of a node or an actor or a person or a human or an element or an entity connected to another entity. We call this, for example, node one connected to node two, and they are connected through an edge. That could be, for example, a colleague working with a colleague, an article to an article, a city connected to a city by an airport, players playing football when a player kick the football to another uh, player. And there is lots of science behind that, how teams win games and how networks could understand how things happen. Uh, people who are married, sexual relationships, uh, fighting, wars, many things can be explained by representing relationships as a network. And the, the power of network, it's not only, doesn't only take into account connected or relationship between A and B, it takes into account the relationship between A and B and B to and C and C and D, because these relationships are all dependent on each other. If, for example, Emma is in that network, her relationship with Sarah is dependent on her relationship with Peter, with Carl, with John, and with Philip, what we call it interdependence. And what most of the common analytic methods do is that they kind of separate things out of the whole picture. And if you, if you compress and reduce the picture or you know, what we call reductionist approach, you don't get that very much value of what you have. And uh, 
that that what made network uh, a powerful paradigm for representing uh, relationships and now probably the, the most uh, used paradigm in complexity science and in understanding the complexity of the world networks can for example be used to represent uh, le miserable this is a uh, a famous play or famous novel we know all about, about it and we can understand who was central who what what were the communities and many of the dynamics of the relationships in this uh, play it can also represent human diseases and how they are connected interconnected relationships to each other it can connect also organizations and specifically in this organization this is part of research about an organization that complained about lots of rumors happening and they asked some scientists to understand why people are afraid and why productivity has decreased. And they found that there are three or four people, this that you see hubs here, who kind of invent rumors and distribute them through the network. And you know, using the network, they were able to boost their productivity. It's not only about that, networks are everywhere. For example, in neural network, they depend on network paradigm. Google is built on a network centrality measure, uh, page rank, if you know. Are aware of that. Also, network can describe, can explain relationship that happen in real life. And this is a, a famous example in a party where people, uh, in the beginning, they don't know each other well, but after some time, networks grow, and growth of network is something that we care about and we study a lot. Networks can also explain disease. This is for uh, H1N1 epidemic. And our models, which, you know, of course, you have heard about a lot of models about COVID-19, they all based on networks. This is uh, the work of Vespianchi and his uh, lab, and they predicted that uh, uh, H1N1 epidemic will spread faster than expected, and they were able to halt the disease by doing some measure measures. Unfortunately, this is not working in every country uh, nowadays. But anyway, <clears throat> so I will go now for networks and education. I will give some examples of my own work. So usually in learning analytics, we look at, for example, if we have Emma, we look at Emma's clicks, access to resources, posts, logins, informative assessment. But we always forget that Emma is in a network, gives information, exchanges information, her actions and her interactions that her uh, utterances are dependent on the actions of others. That's why networks have a role here. I will start, okay, so this is what networks can do. Networks can take lots of information, summarize them into visualization, or produce some kind of mathematical measures for the importance of everything. And that's what Google exactly does. Google takes a lot of web pages, convert them into a network, uh, calculate something close to the eigen centrality, which is page rank, and identify the important pages and how they are linked to each other. And by that, Google is able to translate, uh, to, to give us uh, accurate suggestions. Also, the translation engine of Google has lots of network algorithms inside of it. <clears throat> so if we look at courses, this is some of my publications about them. This is a course which we see this T1 is a teacher. The S is, uh, S is our students. As you can see, the teacher is dominant here. This is not a collaborative process as we might want it to be. So network have a diagnostic power and it's, it's just very easy by just looking at a graph, sometimes called sociogram, to look at interactions in a full course and identify uh, how the patterns work. We can also see that S34 is a bit isolated. If we look here, we can see also that S21 is active, S28 is also active, S3 is active, S11 is active, and uh, S35 is not that very active, is isolated. If we would like really to create some intervention here, we can probably target S34 and S uh, 35 and it doesn't take long time to understand or look into this data it comes from 900 plus posts so teachers do not have to go through all of this but simply can look at a network graph and identify these 
but much more important if we use, uh, okay, so here also network can show us how things happened and explain them. This is a dynamic network, time-lapse, and look at how the network is formed and how it progressed. See? It's kind of like the teacher himself or herself are the one who is driving the interaction. He or she is posting something and students are interacting with. It's not exactly a collaborative process, but again, the teacher has a has a positive role here. He is engaging or she is engaging the students, but also he is by being dominating, he is not, not that much uh, helping a collaborative process that we would like to see. Okay, so one of the things that learning analytics have always promised is to use this data for intervention. And this is what we did here. We, we took three courses. The pattern was already you know, prevalent in many courses. Very centralized process. Students rarely have lines between them. And we did some intervention. We, we introduced some kind of a flexible script to include roles with all the students. You don't have to reply to the teacher. You can reply to each other and you don't have to find an answer for the post. You can debate, you can argue, you can offer alternative solutions, you can agree, you can disagree. The process itself of co-constructing the knowledge is more important than just arriving to an answer. And this is the picture we get. So much collaborative process. I will show you in a video. This animated uh, time. Can you tell me if you hear in the video, the, the, the audio or not? This animated time. Yes. You heard the audio? Okay, thank you. In labs, video shows each interaction as it happened. We show here two periods of the course side by side. Before and after intervention, each circle represents a participant. Circles marked as S1, S2 are students. Circle T1 represents the teacher. Watch the networks form. Compare the pace and distribution of interactions among participants on either side. The left side shows a network dominated by the teacher with very few student-student interactions. The right side shows a participatory network from the beginning. The teacher participates, but does not dominate, and interactions are distributed among a wide range of members. The participatory pattern continues on the right. So in, in the same course, we did also some nice study. We looked at something we call Rich Club, which is... Uh, who is already interacting with who. And we found a very big evidence of that there are some elite students, some would say monarchy of students that a few is interacting with each other and uh, many are left out of outside the, this elite of interacting students. You can see all the yellow things and this club or rich club is interacting all with each other and leaving everybody out. After the intervention, this is the analysis of the same data. We can see that everybody is included, except of course, for very few examples. But again, this is a statistically significant rich club. That means that few is interacting with few, but here many is interacting with many and the other ones are not that very uh, left out or no statistical evidence that they are left out. The same thing, we also did something usually common in uh, sustainability and resilience research. We try to remove students one by one, the most connected ones. The non-collaborative network completely collapsed after removing 25% of the students. I will show that in a video later on. But the, the other collaborative network did not really collapse. And by that, I mean, for example, if you have a network of 30 students interacting, if the teacher, you remove it, if we look at this, for example, if you remove that teacher or if that teacher stops to be present for some reason, will anybody interact with anybody? That's a central question we should always ask ourselves. Have you already embedded the collaborative potential into the students? Are they already collaborating or do they need somebody to kind of nudge them all the time? And uh, we simulated that process here. And as we can see, the centralized network with the teacher did already collapse after removing 
By collapse, I mean there was zero persons who interacted with zero persons. The other network collapsed almost at around 79%, and which is not really different from random. I will show it in a video and uh, look at the left or right sides. With the first person leaves, five or four others leave with him. That was the teacher. They were only responding to that or engaged by the teacher. Look at the right side. You can only see person removed by person. So the impact is really big on the left. And on the right side, only one person leaves at a time, which is already what the person that we are removing. At nine steps, just nine steps, nine persons leave the left network completely collapsed and the right network still, everybody is still interacting there or has not been hardly hit like that. So redundancy or inclusion or diversity or distribution of interaction really matters into the sustainability of collaboration among students. <clears throat> the second thing I've also do done, which is working in groups, this is a uh, big data, but uh, the sample here or the unit for my analysis was groups. And with this study, we found that the group size matters and big groups have lots of isolated students who are also not included and they tend to be isolated and they tend to poorly uh, uh, score or perform. If you look at it, just closely, we see two communities in the big group, but the small group is just one community. This is an isolated community. And this is again another community, group of students. If you look at, at it mathematically, we have seen that the group size is a big uh, negative factor in how the group performs, which gives us a hint how much or how many students we should have in the same group. If we look at physical networks, also did some research about that. Uh, I followed the medical school for five years and uh, we've seen that these networks are colored. The color, the depth of color is uh, their grades. So the, 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 the deep the color is the higher the grades. We see that there is a network or this is a, a community, a group of students by that color mean they interact or friends with each other more than others. So we see that there are communities, groups of students that are based on performance. This is another one, the red one, also high performance. So it is, uh, it, it, it contributes to the notion is, it is who you know that contributes to how you perform probably. There are many explanations for that, that probably natural selection or, or selection people who are high performance usually select high performance. And uh, some other people say it's not about that. It's about you see a model and your information diffuses somehow. There's a lot of debate in the natural science or so, sorry, social science is about which is which. We did research also and um, published in ECTL this year about diffusion. And with diffusion, we looked at uh, how networks could explain the diffusion of uh, information in a collaborative, supportive collaborative learning. And this, this graph shows what I mean, for example, in a usual network, if somebody says burns are serious, and many people said agree, 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 me too, yes, of course, yeah, they will be counted as people who contributed to the discourse. But this is not what we mean. What we mean is, is stimulating a discussion. And if we can see that this person said first stabilize the patient and then do some vital signs, we need to have ABC, airway, breathe, circulation. We see that the information diffused from A to many people, but from B, it did not diffuse to many. And we did some research about that and were able to spot people who contribute more, more meaningful information that would stimulate discussion. And we used clustering to cluster them into three groups. One of them were influencers, just like the influencers you see on uh, social media. Other people who kind of followers, arbitrators, who usually follow the lead from the influencers. And the third group were uh, kind of quiet people or not that very active people who do not contribute novel ideas and not very much following that discourse as we think. Networks can also be used to describe semantics or strategies or constructs. This is a network in a uh, academic writing course. You can see how the strategies or tactics adopted by students are 
interconnected to each other. And you can see that acknowledging is kind of a layer in facilitating the discourse about other things. We can also see that writing arguments is so much connected. And by looking at this summarizing graph, we can understand how the process went. Uh, we can use something we call epistemic network analysis, and in that we compare two groups and how each of the groups have used the self-regulation to enact or implement their uh, collaborative uh, uh, process. We can see that this group have used goals and planning more than the other group. Otherwise, they're kind of very similar. But anyway, just with a one single network, you can summarize everything that happened in a network in, in a group. Networks can also reflect or uh, represent the correlation or uh, the interaction between variables. This one, uh, the FG's final grade. This is the session count. This is contribution to forum. This is regularity, and we can see that these three variables are the ones that have been uh, explained in the final grade. But these ones are explained by duration, explained by lecture count, explained by reading forums, and also explained by frequency. So by this very simple and uh, summarizing figure, we can understand your online behavior of students and where exactly we should or we can uh, optimize. Uh, this is another network between variables, and this network is uh, among uh, variables of uh, the same academic writing I've shown before, uh, but this time this is a correlation network. So every factor is correlated to other one would be represented or would be would see some connection like that. We have something we call centrality measures that we can see that using the central points, we can optimize the interaction. For example, acculturating, social bonding, are probably the most important central symptoms that we can, uh, sorry, central factors that we can use them to help uh, students succeed in such task. Um, and then I will speak about time and the temporal networks are also the one that I will talk about. Uh, temporal networks are a bit different in a way that, uh, for example, we usually, if you look on the right side, we usually have, uh, connected entities like that, but temporal network we take the time into account. So A to B is an interaction, just like you call somebody on a phone, and B to C is again another interaction, but they are not really connected. So if you call A or you call B, and then after some time you call C, you do not, each of them is not involved in the same call. But if I represent them in a network like that, the static network that you've just seen, they look as if they are interconnected themselves. It's, it's a different paradigm, but you know, each of them is, is used to represent different phenomena. For example, if you would like to go to uh, Sydney from Stockholm, you probably have to go through uh, transient in, in, for example, Dubai. Uh, but if, if you look at the network and you see, you see that they're connected through a connection, then you're fine, you'll find an aeroplane. But when you are already traveling and you want to catch that flight, you need to see that both flights will be concurrently at certain point together in Dubai, or there is an overlap between this uh, flight and this flight in Dubai so that you can take Stockholm to Dubai and then spend an hour or two and then catch the next flight. But if the next flight is only a weekly flight that travels just, for example, after a week, you have to spend that week in Dubai. So this is the difference between static networks, which just give you a static uh, representation of the interconnectedness, but temporal networks that you have to take input into considerations, things like latency and concurrency and other things. Do you, do you hear me? Do you have any questions? Please stop me and uh, let me know. I can, I can definitely answer the questions in real time. Okay? Do you have any questions so far? Okay, so the temporal networks, I will give an example by video. This is a static network and this is a temporal network. It's exactly the same one, 
The static network, as you see, it exaggerates, it amplifies the connectivity of people. At each, any time point, you see that people are connected all the time, but temporally, they are not. This is what happened. There is so much to know or to gain from understanding the interactions between this group. So temporally, you can simply understand how, for example, people interact in a discourse, and these are temporal networks or snapshot networks in a, that at certain time points, two, four, six, eight, 12, and you can see that people at that stage are writing, acculturating, writing arguments, applying feedback and acknowledging. At another stage, they are applying feedback, writing, argumenting, acculturating and acknowledging. At another stage, they are doing something else. And by, by using this multi-layer view of the network, you can understand how stages happen. This is another way of representing the network as this is a longitudinal way of looking at everything. When lines are in close proximity, they means that they happen together. You see that it is, um, it is intense or closely together uh, uh, in the middle, which is in the middle of the course. I would say assignment because this is just part of the course. You can also see that resource management was a bit dis disconnected, dissociated and uh, by looking at this just one graph, you see all what happened and how people have used things over all the duration of a course, not just one snapshot, just like the one in the bottom. You can also understand the flow. This is one video session, 160 minutes of interactions. And you can see what happened after students agreed on something. Immediately after two minutes, they started defining their task and they started enacting the task in five minutes after agreement. But they took longer time to re-monitor what happened again, and they took a bit longer time to adapt and reflect, and they took a bit longer time to be motivated again or to express motivation. So by this, we understand the flow of emotion, reaction, interactions, or tactics that students apply. Uh, temporal networks also, this is a, a, a predictive algorithm created on daily basis, but for brevity, I, uh, I'm only representing around 10 of it here. This is using uh, the temporal network mathematical information in the second day of the course. And you can see that we get an R squared of 4.6, which is pretty fair, just uh, that we're doing it in the second day of the course. Then some diverse networks. This is one uh, historical uh, represent historical network citation network among papers that an article we are uh, we're about to publish uh, in, uh, in transactions in computing education uh, showing up the history of computational thinking. It is of course started as uh, many of us know about after uh, Janet Wing. Uh, article about the concept in 2006, which she followed by another article in 2008, and people started, you know, interacting with the idea and it became a, a concept now. With this, with this network, we can simply understand how a whole field developed and grown and happened. So it's a temporal network and again, a citation network. We can also look from the same article, what are the concepts we use here, the community principle to, to group things together. We see that programming, education, games, robotics, STEM, K-12, robotics and middle school are the main connect, mainly connected in the heart of uh, the computational thinking paradigm. We also see the problem solving is a bit, uh, some big things and also computer science because it, uh, it's also used in, um, higher education and high schools. Uh, this is another network from an article about gra uh, games. Uh, and it shows us the, the collaborating countries about games in education. We can see uh, USA and Canada and Australia, which is New Zealand, New Zealand which is English speaking countries. We can also see for, with them Saudi Arabia, which is probably because of uh, students who are on funded by the government there, also China. There are many students who are funded by these countries. I probably would also expect Turkey because these are the three countries that send a lot of students to 
to USA. We can also see Spain, Mexico, uh, uh, Argentina, Portugal, which is based on language and proximity. We can also see a European uh, cluster of, of uh, countries, Finland, Italy, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Ireland, Belgium. We can also see France, Switzerland, and Luxembourg. I think this is a bit driven by proximity and language. And of course, there are other factors too. But by looking at a network, we can understand how collaborative pattern is happening in the games. And for this network, we have used around 10,000 articles to build it. Uh, this is the network of learning analytics. And uh, what I would like, for example, we have a very good, strong connection between United Kingdom and Australia. I think this uh, pretty much driven by the good collaboration language and also by migrating uh, scholars who migrated from uh, UK to Australia. Australia is, is attracting a lot. You can see Sweden and Finland. Uh, hopefully I have contributed to that link. There are lots of links between many scholars from Sweden and Finland here. Uh, we can also see USA, China again, Canada, Japan, Hong Kong and Ireland. And again, this probably is driven by uh, funded the students and also by interests. Uh, I can stop at this point if, uh, and start discussing things because what I would say is a bit drifting a little bit from networks, although it's still network, but I can stop here if you like. We can take the questions. What do you think, Alexi? It's really up to you. I mean, if you wish to- uh, Yeah, I will, I will just give you, okay. So I will just give examples about these things you know just uh brainstorming something it's it's far from i can explain everything in one presentation but for example we have something we call process maps and process maps can tell us what happened in a course for example this is a video of the process and we can see that students start by viewing the course going to collaborate and then do the assignments you will see the transitions of students among uh, different actions in the course each point represents uh, a session of a single student. And you can see the date now. This was my course, my, my own course that I taught last year. So just one summarizing uh, animation like that sums all the course. These are some types of network. These nodes are actions. And again, the edges or the links between them are transitions. Uh, sequence are not exactly networks, so I will skip them. But also time again, uh, according to Pink Floyd. Uh, here I study networks during time and I try to study the circadian rhythm. We were able to spot that high achievers usually interact with their learning materials during the working hours. And we produce nice predictive algorithms based on that. We also find that high achievers work much higher at much higher rates interact much, at much higher rates during the first day of the week and that has happened first day second day third and fourth way of the week almost consistently the red group or the light red group the high achievers were the ones who interacted most in the first day uh, if we look at the year level we see also that high achievers the blue line starts um, or starts engaged really high and low achievers by the end of the year, they kind of try to catch up. This is a full year thing. Thank you so much for uh, listening today. And um, yeah, we'll be happy to take your questions.